Good morning, folks. Welcome to the show where NASA's finding water on the moon story is the seventh most important item on the docket. I'm going to earn that like button click today, folks. Let's start with our star over at spaceweathernews.com, and there is an eruption on the north which you may have missed in the opening sequence while I suffered the inability to stop talking. But clearly, a filament had a snap eruption detaching from one side of the connection, the leading edge. In 304 angstroms, it is easier to catch the filament whip all the way across to the left, and there is only a minor solar wind intensification signature visible on stereo. Lucky again. What was nearly imperceptible in those wavelengths was the solar flaring. Certainly nothing major, but we do see the increased production at the sunspot groups that we expect as the solar cycle ramps up to a maximum in the next year or so. Quick look at the solar wind top left. Purple is plasma speed wavering between high range of normal and above average intensity. This is allowing geomagnetic unrest to continue with the intermittent yellow bars on the bottom. Let's head over to the next 48 hours for the southern United States and the Gulf of Mexico. Hurricane Zeta is on the move northward. The southern push of Arctic blast will shy back and return northward as though the hurricane was a shepherd behind the massive cold wave, pushing it north. Hours of torrential downpours are likely for numerous areas and we can't yet forecast its activity near the Appalachians. Now let's go about as far out as we can go. Beyond the stars of the Milky Way, there are obviously many galaxies, but they are actually clustered in groups and superclusters. The plasma amidst those groups, the intracluster medium, is the least well understood aspect of plasma cosmology. Do large scale connections run through the groups? Are clusters islands in space? What does the stratification of material tell us about the cosmos? First, we have to understand and model the plasma turbulence, baby steps on a long road here. Here's the moon news. Observers are likely to be the only ones to fully appreciate the significance of this story, which now includes the solar wind water creation mechanism. It's our 2013 star water hypothesis literally in a NASA video. It's more important than the discovery itself or the potential to find water everywhere on the moon. We know it's everywhere. Folks, there is a beast of a planet about 260 light years away. It's a hot Neptune tearing around the star to make a year in less than 24 hours. It is so hot that its atmosphere should have been stripped away by now, but it's still there. And as the title implies, it's back to the drawing board as astronomers can't account for this planet. Up next, veteran observers, how many times have we seen plankton, chlorophyll, or krill be the focus of a study that upends the food chain collapse story of global warming? Over a dozen at least, and they're all thriving despite expectations, when really one should have probably expected their reaction to having more food would be to thrive. It's their adaptability and their interactions with that changing environment. And folks, our climate uncertainty coverage this year has mostly been about clouds in the atmosphere, but it's the oceans today. And for climate models to take the, uh, sorry, we forgot mantra on this one, brings us one step closer to dethroning a climate deception. And just a quarter step to the side, we find a sentence I've been waiting to see in the Ice Age discussion for years. Yes, an underlying ice age and interglacial cycle exists, but there is so much more to the data. And now they are officially saying what I've been saying for a while. Things like tilt and orbital variation in the Milankovitch cycles cannot be the whole story of climate variation over longer scales. There's too much more to the data. This is where the external forcing and internal mitigation mechanisms come into play to end warm periods abruptly or skip them altogether. Lastly, folks, we're coming back to the big story from last week. Another field acceleration loss has occurred. The questions and interest have been voluminous. And first, what we meant and what's shown here when we say the field acceleration took place in the central west Pacific, traceable to the core mantle boundary, we were discussing the internal structure, the intermediate axis of Earth, with one core protrusion beneath Africa and the other beneath the central west Pacific. It is interesting that we can easily pick out on top the north and south magnetic hemispheres of the planet. In the middle, first order harmonic, we see the region between the South Atlantic anomaly and the Bermuda Triangle as the peak signature. On the bottom, the second order shows the rapid field change subject in this paper. They also did a little update to the South Magnetic Anomaly mapping. They look the same only at a rapid glance. The bottom picture shows the expansion and deepening of the South Atlantic fields. It's as plain as day. The cycle is due, and Earth is changing exactly as expected. We greatly appreciate your support, and it helps to know what to expect. Pre-order of our expectations, history, and analysis is aiming to be in November. 
website members. You've got another Deeper Look episode, either a good refresher for seasoned observers or a bombshell for newer viewers. We've got your wind maps and shots of our star to close, and of course, we'll do this all again tomorrow. Right here, but right now, it's 4.20 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe, everyone.